Hey, skeptics, it's Juliana here. I am here today with a special back in time episode because my thesis is coming into the pointy end and I need to spend every single hour of my day writing. But I got a special one for you today. On the 15th of August, so that's yesterday actually at the time of recording this special announcement, the Adelaide City Council announced that English war criminal Edwin Murrant, who went by the alias Harry the Breaker Morant during his time in Australia, will not be added to the Australian Boer War Memorial. This has followed just under 12 months of campaigning by some of Morant's champions and a distant relative of his as well. The City Council has found that it would bring disgrace on Adelaide and is not appropriate to add Morant's name to the War Memorial. And I must say, I agree. I applaud the Council and I urge them to stand fast in this decision. And unfortunately, I don't think we've heard the end of the breaker. So I thought I'd re-release my episode on Breaker Moran. Just a warning that this episode does deal with war crimes, so listener caution is advised. We're discussing murder and racism as well in the Harry Morant episode, so I advise listener discretion, and the episode may not be appropriate particularly for younger fans of The Skeptical Historian. A quick technical note as well, I had sound issues when recording this episode the first time, so there is a bit of a gap in between the first and last part of the episode, and you will hear a distinct change in the sound quality. Sincere apologies. Thankfully, now that I have proper equipment and Skeptical Studios is up and running, it should never happen again. So I hope you enjoy this trip back in time with a past Skeptical episode, and let's make sure that we continue to come together to keep Harry Morant far away from war memorials. Enjoy the show, Skeptics. It's 1897 in the small town of Hawkesbury, New South Wales. In years to come, this will actually become a thriving regional city and in the 21st century, it could almost be an outer suburb of Sydney, to be honest. But right now, at the end of the 19th century, it's mostly large farms, although the town is growing steadily. It's a Friday, the 14th of May, to be exact, and the 18th exhibition of the Hawkesbury Agricultural Association otherwise known as the Hawkesbury Show, is in full swing. It's gone well so far, although some of the animals exhibited have left much to be desired, at least according to an unimpressed journalist from the Sydney Evening News. However, even he admits that there are some very fine cattle, along with an excellent show of poultry and a moderate show of dogs. He's more interested, as it turns out, in the fruit and flowers on display but right now he's probably the only one worrying about such things because the star attraction has arrived and is here to put on a show. Dargan's Grey, the famed buck jumper. Dargan's Grey is a horse, an eight-year-old, rough-looking grey, but very muscular, according to the paper. And according to another newspaper, to look at him, one would hardly think he had a buck left. But this horse has thrown 32 of the best riders at shows all around the colony. And two locals have already tried and failed to remain atop him. In fact, one had to be carried off to the hospital after being knocked out cold in the fall. Then another man emerges from the crowd and says he'll have a go. He's known around these parts, not as a horseman, but as an excellent bush poet whose verses frequently grace the pages of the local news. Amid jeers that there'll be an inquest for sure after this one, the poet climbs up in the saddle and prepares to tame the wild buck jumper. The doubters would probably have been less doubtful if they knew who the poet, who they know only as Harry Morant, actually was. He's an expert horseman, as the crowd is about to discover, and a born showman. He earned his nickname the breaker, taming horses up in Queensland, although the locals here think it's just an ostentatious pen name. He's the kind of person who will jump a blindfolded horse over a pair of six-wire fences just to prove he can. In fact, when it comes to horses, there's nothing the aptly nicknamed breaker can't do, or, more correctly, won't do as long as he has an audience. And that proves as true with Darrigan's Grey as any other horse. 
Unlike the last 34 men to try their luck, Breaker not only stays on the horse, but successfully ties him out until he stands meek and quiet and covered in sweat, and even allows this man to take him on a victory lap of the arena, calm and docile as anything. It's quite a show, and one the crowd won't forget in a hurry. Morant was duly awarded the show's prize for the best exhibition of horsemanship, and people would still be talking about his famed ride of Derrigan's Grey five years later, when his name was in the paper again, this time for an entirely different reason. The breaker, Harry Morant, is dead. (gasps) Killed not in a horse riding accident, as most people always assumed he would be, He had the air of a man heading for a sudden, violent end, but shot, some even say murdered, by a firing squad out in South Africa, where he was fighting against the Boers. The papers are full of lurid stories. They say Morant and a sadistic pair of sidekicks went about murdering prisoners of war and, horrifyingly, killing civilians and their children. Shock echoes around the outback towns of Queensland and New South Wales, where this dashing daredevil was well-known and greatly admired. The breaker? The murderer? Seems impossible. Or does it? I'm Juliana, and you're listening to The Skeptical Historian. Hello fellow skeptics, thank you so very much for joining me. As always, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung people on whose lands I am podcasting today and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Shout out also to Studio 4 at the State Library of Victoria where this episode is being recorded. For more information or to book the studio for yourself, please head to www.slv. Dot vic dot gov dot au. And before we ride headlong into today's episode, I know my puns are terrible, but I love them. I do just want to give a quick warning. Today we are discussing some very heavy themes, including war and war crimes, and also quite a bit of cruelty to animals. So this might not be the episode for everyone, especially perhaps not for young listeners. I will also give a warning for racism. We're dealing with Imperial Europe in all the white supremacist glory of the late 19th and early 20th century. So some of the background we will be discussing today will touch on racism and discrimination against people of colour, especially Indigenous people in what is today South Africa, and also mentions of slavery and apartheid. So please just be aware of that. But now, without further ado, allow me to tell you the story of one of the most colourful, complex and I'll be frank, cruel men who ever found their way into Australian folklore. Breaker Morant. He was a stockman, a horsebreaker, a petty thief, a daredevil showman, a bush poet, a drover, a con man, a soldier, a womanizer, and a murderer. In February of 1902, during his service in the Boer War, he was executed by firing squad after being found guilty of 12 murders although he was actually responsible for at least 20 and quite possibly more. His victims included nine prisoners of war, all disarmed and cooperating, and a further 10 civilians, at least three of whom were children, two aged five, and one was a sick 12-year-old boy who was shot in his father's arms. The 20th victim was a priest who witnessed one of these atrocities, and Morant decided to silence him rather than risk this man reporting to commanding authorities. Now, I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure that being found guilty of 12 murders by an actual court, especially when you've actually committed 20 of them, should immediately disqualify one from hero status. Yet, more than 120 years after Breaker Morant hit the ground in a hail of bullets, There are those who, in the words of historian, author, and columnist Peter Fitzsimmons, shriek out into the badlands at night, demanding a pardon for this man and his fellow murderer, Peter Hancock. 
the why? This is the question I want to examine. How does a war criminal, and make no mistake, these murders were war crimes, become a national hero? Over the years, there has been at least one retrial, if we can call it that, although to be frank, it was more of a reenactment, that has seen him ride free. And Morant's defenders argue that he was executed not because he committed murders, but because he was an Australian and was therefore an expendable pawn in Great Britain's game of world conquest. They claim there were irregularities in the court-martial procedure and that Lord Kitchener, the Minister for War at the time, had already decided on the verdict before the trial commenced. They back this up with testimony from those who knew Moran during his life and say that such brutality was simply out of character. While these people can't quite claim that Moran didn't commit all these murders, they give it a bloody good try. So for those listening who have never heard of Breaker Morant, lucky you, let me give you a quick overview before we get sceptical. Now, Harry Morant's real name was Edwin Murrant, and he was originally from England, so not an Australian, and came to Australia in 1883. He had been lucky enough to receive quite a good education for his background, and he'd learned to mimic the accent of the British aristocracy. So when he decided to try his luck in Australia and also flee creditors in England, he'd racked up large debts by pretending to be a member of aforementioned aristocracy. He could easily pretend to be a mighty important person and nobody would question him. The surname he adopted, Morant, was similar enough to his own that he could remember it and was also the same as that of a famous British admiral. So he frequently pretended to be this man's estranged son, a lie that would be repeated as truth throughout his life and after his death. And this is despite the Admiral himself denying it multiple times. So the Breaker spent most of his time in the outback areas of Queensland and New South Wales while he was in Australia, breaking in horses, which is where he got his nickname, and enthralling people with made-up fictions about his past. He was a very good poet too. His work was frequently published in various local newspapers. And when it came to horses, riding Dargan's Grey was just one of his many daredevil feats. However, it seems that poetry and breaking in horses were actually the only things he was good at, to be honest. Unless, of course, one can also be an expert at lying, borrowing money and sleeping with other men's wives also pursuits at which Harry Morant excelled. So he drifted through the outback in this manner for about 20 years, occasionally spending time in prison for unpaid debts or being drunk and disorderly. The other thing he could do was drink before signing up for the Boer War and leaving Australia in 1900. Now, the Boer War was initially very popular in Australia and lots of Australian men, young and old, signed up for the war effort. But Morant was not one of those infected with patriotic fervour. He wanted to join the Boer War because he hoped that after a short stint of service, he could get a passage back to England. Also, less well known, he needed to get out of Australia because his creditors and probably a few angry husbands were closing in. Now, Morant was the type of man who was always up for an adventure, although he was older than most of the men who had signed up. He was pushing 40 rather than 20. But like them, he probably had no real idea what he was getting into. He wasn't a regular soldier and had not been to war before. Now, when it comes to the Boer War in South Africa, I don't have time to go deep into it today, but I will give a a brief overview. So this was actually one of the bloodiest conflicts for both combatants and civilians Um, in the British Empire, and some have argued in the world prior to 1914 and the outbreak of World War I. The Boers were descendants of Dutch religious settlers who had come to South Africa in the 1600s, 1700s, and they were attempting to drive the English out of their territories. In 1899, when war broke out, England controlled the coast of South Africa, an area known as Cape Colony, And they were pushing further inland into the two Boer republics to try and take over the lucrative gold and diamond fields that had been discovered there. Now, black South Africans featured heavily on both sides of this conflict, of course, 
although, as is often the case, they were written out of history. In the Boer republics, blacks were actually still enslaved, while in Cape Colony they were technically free but could only work in certain fields, so your dirty jobs, manual labor, and domestic service for the most part, and they could only be paid native wages, as it was called, so they couldn't be given the same wages as whites for the same work. Now, while some of them did fight on both sides, most black Africans during the Boer War worked as servants, either for individual officers or units on the British side, or for Boer families on the other side. A white man's war over their country, unfortunately, was not new to them, and they managed the best they could in the face of increasing violence, often violence that was directed at them by both sides, as much as it was at each of the nominal enemies. Very common for a British soldier or a Boer soldier, it didn't matter to take out the frustrations of a day on an unfortunate black man who happened to be standing within arm's reach. And, of course, very few charges were ever laid. I know in the British Army, at least, there were some suggestions that charges should be laid over mistreatment of some of their black servants, but this never eventuated and no one was punished. Now, initially, the Boers, the white South Africans, were having things their way during the Boer War. But by 1901, this was changing. Now, the Boers were a highly mobile and very effective guerrilla force. And this was something that the British Army, which was still highly regimented and using outdated and inflexible tactics, was not accustomed to dealing with. In the early stages of the war, the Boers inflicted huge casualties on the British. And as the guerrilla units became more and more fractured from each other as the war progressed, it started to become, I suppose you could almost say it became lots of little individual wars, each individual group fighting for the same thing, but there was no centralised control. A good example would be the French resistance during the Nazi occupation of Paris in the early years of that occupation before it became more centralised towards the end of the war. Now, in the Boer War, these small groups of Boers started doing things like blowing up railways, derailing the trains, raiding British supply dumps, and they relied on the local civilian population to assist them. That is something that all guerrillas will share. By 1901, however, these tactics weren't working as well as they had been. The British had created their own guerrilla units. They were fighting fire with fire. So these were mounted troops who were able to live off the land and they could deploy similar tactics against the Boers that the Boers had used on them. Now, Lord Kitchener, in charge of the Boer War, also implemented an incredibly brutal scorched earth policy to deprive the Boer guerrillas of the means to continuously supply themselves. Homesteads were burned, livestock was killed, crops were deliberately destroyed, and the land was salted so that it could not be used again before the civilians who had lived there were herded into concentration camps to die of starvation and disease. In this post-World War II world that we're in now, I don't use the term concentration camp lightly, even though it is just effectively just a term that means a camp with a concentration of people. But I think we can safely use it to describe the prisoner of war camps, or there weren't even prisoner of war camps, the camps for non-combatant civilians at this time in South Africa being run by the British. Between 1900 and 1902, 30,000 Boers, mostly women and children, died in these camps, while a further 14,000 black South Africans who had been working for Boer families, either as servants or in some cases as slaves, died in these segregated camps as well. And most of these deaths were due to starvation, disease, and also neglect. There was not a lot of medical help to be had if they were sick, but also the doctors and nurses who were there were not too concerned. If they died, they died. Who cared? They weren't British, was the prevailing theory. And it's here that we find our murderer to be, Harry Morant. Initially, he'd just been another unremarkable colonial soldier. But by 1901, he'd been commissioned as a lieutenant in one of these British mounted guerrilla units, specifically the Bushveld Carpeneers, or the BVC, as they were known, out in the field, far away from the watchful eye of commanders who might object, 
the breaker's true colours began to shine. Not only a drinker and a liar, he proved to be a sadist and a bully as well, with disastrous consequences for at least 20 innocent people. Now I'm going to take a quick break here and I'll be back to go deeper into this story in just a moment. Welcome back, skeptics. Now, it is worth noting here that Morant didn't turn into a murderer immediately. Initially, he was an excellent officer. He was well thought of by his men and by his immediate superior, Captain Percy Hunt, and was known to be protective of some of the younger men in the unit as well. He was relatively kind to prisoners as well, although I have to say, when you're sending them to die in a filthy concentration camp, I don't know how much this really means. However, his sadistic streak was starting to show. And I think there is one episode in particular which illustrates this perfectly. Now, before I get into it, this story includes shocking cruelty to animals. So if you'd rather not hear it, fast forward and I'll meet you in a couple of minutes. So about a month before the first murder, Morant and his friend Peter Hancock went out on a patrol to look for any sign of boar gorillas, but didn't find any. What they did find and bring back with them was a long-tailed monkey. Now Morant then tied this monkey by its tail to a stake in the ground, and then he and Hancock amused themselves by shooting at it to make it jump and hop around, which is just utterly sick. They didn't want to kill it, just wing it occasionally and scare it to make it dance for them. Now, because quite a few of the soldiers looking on were human beings with functioning consciences, unlike Morant and Hancock, they objected and told the men to let the monkey go. But the two lieutenants refused and continued to torment the little animal, probably until it died. We don't know what happened, but I'd put money on that monkey having been killed. Interestingly, though, this wasn't the first instance of sadism on Morant's part either. In Australia, following his famed ride on Darkens Grey, he had written down the Salvation Army band on his way out of town, despite having had room to go around them, and severely injured some of the band members. But he'd continued on without a care in the world. He was also known to be particularly violent when he was drunk. And even while sober, he enjoyed picking fights with people who were unable to fight back. His descent into murder happened on the 6th of August, 1901, when Captain Hunt and a young Sergeant Morant was particularly fond of, named Frank Eland, were killed while attempting to ambush a Boer homestead in which a guerrilla unit had taken refuge. I do want to point out, even if the guerrilla unit hadn't taken refuge in there, they were going to burn it down anyway. Now, Morant was honestly devastated by their deaths, particularly that of the young sergeant, Frank Elan. This man had received a photo of his newborn daughter from his newlywed wife not long before. Morant had been very protective of him and had tried to convince Captain Hunt to leave Elan with him at the fort while Hunt took other men for the ambush. But Eland had been keen to go and Hunt had taken him along. Both were relatively inexperienced men and they made the mistake of rushing the homestead and were immediately cut down in a flurry of bullets while the more experienced men in the party were forced to retreat. At this point, I will honestly say that I feel a little bit sorry for Morant. He had lost an officer he was fond of and who had promised to bring him into high society in England when the war was over, but their friendship really was genuine, and a young man that he felt deeply responsible for. In fact, such was his devastation over Elan's death that he never spoke of him again. Some historians have interpreted this as proof that the relationship was superficial, but I disagree. Eland was a regular soldier with no high society connections and he had nothing to offer the breaker. Yet the older man was truly fond of him and really wanted to keep him safe. 
The relationship was deep, it was real, and I think Morant felt that loss more keenly than the loss of his captain, although as a man with his eye always on the next story, he never let it show. And it is here that the story of Breaker Morant takes its first dark turn. Hunt and Eland had been killed in action and then buried by the men who had managed to withdraw from the homestead after they managed to secure it. They even had time to build coffins and mark the graves. Yet Morant, who was not there, claimed that the bodies had been horribly mutilated by the boars. Despite being informed that the only mild indignity committed had been that the corpses had been stripped, Morant refused to believe it, and the stories of mutilation became wilder and wilder. And by nightfall, Morant convinced himself and most of the BBC that Captain Hunt had actually been tortured before being killed, which was a complete fabrication. He was shot, his men had to retreat, his body was later stripped, whether by the boars or by others, we don't know. And then he was found by his men in relatively the same position he fell. But truth didn't matter because the story of his tortured officer gave Breaker the excuse he needed to go on a murderous rampage that would last for two blood-soaked months. So it's here that my sympathy for him ends. Shortly after Hunt and Elon had been killed, Breaker, who had taken over command, he had been Captain Hunt's second in command, ordered an attack on a ball camp nearby, and he claimed that those men must be the ones who had murdered his beloved captain. Now, at the time, he had no idea if this was true, but there were members of the BBC who did know, and they told him that it wasn't true because the men who had killed Hunt had themselves been killed in the firefight. But that didn't matter to Breaker. The Boers in that camp were given no chance to surrender and the BBC didn't even check to see if they were combatants or not before they fired on them. Now, the majority of them did get away, although they had to abandon wounded horses and their wagons, which had most of their supplies. But one man was left behind. Now, this was a man named Floris Vizier who had been shot in the heel. Now, according to the British Manual of Military Law 1899, under which laws the BVC were theoretically operating, as an enemy rendered helpless by wounds. Vizier should have been treated, and it was illegal to kill him. Very clear statement in that manual. Morant didn't care. After a drumhead court-martial, read Complete Sham Show Trial, in which the only evidence presented was lies, Morant forced members of the BVC to form a firing party and murdered Forrest Vizier. However, when confronted by some of the men who refused to be party to the murder of a wounded, unarmed man, Morant insisted that he was not giving the orders, but was merely following them. His orders had come from none other than Lord Kitchener himself and were very clear. No prisoners were to be taken. This is an ugly euphemism for all boars are to be killed. It's worth pausing here to examine this claim in some detail because it's one of the most common statements made among Morant's defenders in Australia. Morant should never have been put on trial, let alone executed, they say, because he was just following orders. And at the time, this was an acceptable defense against an accusation of war crimes. Leaving aside the fact that this is not quite true, the superior orders defence had always had mixed results, and that even if these claims were true, Morant had already violated the laws of war in executing Vizier, did the order exist? It's actually a hard question to answer because Lord Kitchener was certainly the worst type of 19th century aristocratic British officer. He believed that his class had been ordained by God to rule the world and disdained the idea that he and his fellows were subject to any laws other than their own. At the time this order was supposedly given, however, the POW camps for combatants and the concentration camps for civilians were severely overcrowded and some camps had indicated that they would not be able to take any more prisoners. So did Kitchener 
whose only concern was for the glory of the empire he served, decide to solve this problem by stopping the flow of prisoners entirely? Did he really order that any Boers taken prisoner by his soldiers were to be killed? The uncomfortable truth is probably. It was certainly in his character to give such an order. But beyond that, there is reliable anecdotal evidence that Kitchener gave an order to take no prisoners, and this comes from his staff who were working with him at the time. However, he was smart enough not to write it down, if indeed he did give it, and it was deliberately vague enough to ensure that if it ever came back to haunt him, he could deny that he'd ever ordered prisoners be killed. This is a standard tactic that's been used throughout history in these kind of situations. Some have dismissed the idea, saying it made no sense. Kitchener didn't need to give an order to kill prisoners because the British were winning the war, the Boers were surrendering at a rate of 1,000 per month, and the British concentration camps were already getting really bad press at home thanks to the excellent work of human rights campaigner Emily Hobhouse. Why would Kitchener want to risk pouring fuel on the fire by killing prisoners? Now, these arguments have merit. I'm not going to pretend they don't. But I disagree with the idea that if this order was given, it simply defies common sense. I also find it a little ironic that the words common sense can be applied to Lord Kitchener. He had outdated ideas, outdated tactics, got thousands of men killed in both the Boer War and then later in the First World War, which only stopped when he himself was killed in a shipwreck. Yet good old British class system ensured that he was constantly being rewarded for getting soldiers killed. So not a man who the words common sense should really apply to, I think. But I digress slightly. While it is true that the British were winning the Boer War, it had been dragging on for two years now, which was quite a long conflict at the time, and it promised to go on for a heck of a lot longer unless Kitchener could find a way to neutralise the Boers entirely. Many of the guerrilla commanders were prepared to fight to the bitter end, and in fact they called themselves the bitter enders, and Kitchener knew this. What was more, the war was becoming incredibly unpopular in Britain. Despite attempts by the establishment to keep knowledge of the hideous conditions in the concentration camps from the British public, Emily Hobhouse had been able to publish her work. Now, the war had previously been quite popular, but the publication of her accounts and of photos of the inmates caused absolute outrage in Britain and began to turn people against the war. Money was also a huge issue as the British public were becoming increasingly angry about paying for a war which seemed endless and that had no immediate and discernible benefit to them. As Kitchener would have known, if you lose the home front, you lose the war. He needed a way to end it quickly and stop ever more people from filling the concentration camps, which were the source of much public outrage. Killing prisoners out on the veldt, the plains of South Africa, when no one could see and no meddling human rights campaigners or war correspondents could go, actually makes a horrible kind of sense from that perspective. No more prisoners to fill the concentration camps means less British money being spent to maintain them. And if anything does get out, there's nothing linking Kitchener directly to it. That being said, I am compelled to mention, again, that there is no proof this illegal order existed, and also, even if it did, it does not exonerate Breaker Moret. International law recognises that, in very exceptional circumstances, a person may be in a position where they have to carry out an illegal order, not because they want to but because they are under a legal obligation to follow the order or they didn't know the order itself was unlawful or the order was not obviously unlawful. There are exceptions to these, but those are the three times in which it is appropriate under international law to carry out an order that is unlawful. 
When Break and Morant formed a firing squad to murder Floris Visser, he was not legally obliged to follow the very vague order from Lord Kitchener. He knew full well what he was doing was illegal, as evidenced by the fact that he actually threatened to shoot his own men who refused to participate, and shooting an unarmed, wounded prisoner who has surrendered and is no threat to you is very obviously unlawful. I think it's also worth pointing out, putting aside the legalities of the issue for a moment, that it's wrong. It's wrong, plain and simple, to shoot unarmed prisoners, full stop. It's a war crime. It's a moral crime. And there's absolutely no excuse for it. Not now, and certainly not then either. In summary, even if that order had existed, and I'll go on the record and say I believe it probably did, Morant should not have followed it. It's also worth noting that he would have been in no personal danger and nobody at headquarters really knew what the BVC were up to. They relied on reports from Morant himself. They only found out about this murder and the ones that followed because the soldiers under Morant managed to smuggle a letter to them. These are not the actions of someone reluctantly following illegal orders, fearing for their own life. They are the actions of someone who wants to kill others and has found an excuse to do it. On returning home from South Africa in 1902, one of Morant's own men was asked what he thought of his commander. And he replied that he thought he killed for the love of killing. And that is a disturbing thought, if ever there was one. I'm going to pause here for another break. And when I get back, I'm going to look at the next chapter of the Break Morant story and another argument his supporters like to make about why he is really just a misunderstood hero. And I'm back. The next argument usually put forward in favour of a pardon for Morant is that he was so angry and grief-stricken over the deaths of his fellows that it sent him into a murderous rage. In the heat of the moment, he shot someone he believed most likely to have been behind the deaths of his friends. Military law at the time recognised provocation as a defence for the murder of combatants and enemy civilians. So, according to proponents of this theory, Breaker hadn't even broken the law at the time. I could believe this if Floris Vizier had been Morant's first and only victim. If, when passions had cooled and reasonable heads had prevailed, the murders had stopped, this would be a reasonable argument. Enough for a pardon? Absolutely not. And even in those circumstances, the murder of another human being is completely unjustifiable. However, this argument has about as much substance as a puff of smoke, as the killing of Vizier was just the beginning. What's more, Morant took the time, as I mentioned earlier, to convene a trumped-up court-martial and made up charges to justify the murder of Vizier. He falsely claimed the captured boar had been wearing Captain Hunt's clothes at the time they found him. This was not a man acting on the spur of the moment. This was a highly calculating person taking steps to try and ensure his illegal and unpopular order could be justified. As we might say today, Breaker Morant was trying to cover his ass. Shortly after murdering Vizier, eight war prisoners were brought to Fort Edward, where Morant was stationed, in preparation to be moved to a POW camp. Once more, claiming that he had orders from Kitchener, Morant had the disarmed, helpless men lined up and put in front of a firing squad. This time, when some of the men refused to participate, Morant viciously bullied them until they complied and the eight men fell down dead. It's also worth noting with those men that he pushed into participating, the group had taken the eight boars away from the fort and down the track as if they were escorting them to a POW camp. The, they couldn't be seen from the fort. It was too far away from the fort for any help to come to them if they'd want it, and Morant could have just shot them too, and they were perfectly aware of that. I'm not saying it makes it right, but it is something to bear in mind with those men who were forced to participate. 
They really did not want to. But by this point, when it comes to break and Morant, we have passed murder and are into mass murder. And by this point, Morant is personally responsible for the illegal killing of nine prisoners. A man in the grips of a dark grief acting rashly on impulse? I think not. This particular murder, which became known as the Eight Boars case, was made even worse because there was a witness, a German missionary named Daniel Hesse. He had seen the eight boars taken out of the fort and marched along the road, away from anyone who might see what Morant was about to do, and had spoken to some of them who he knew he'd ministered to a few of these men before. Morant had sent him on his way, but Hesse returned to Fort Edward and he was alarmed to see no sign of the eight men. They shouldn't have been able to reach a prisoner of war camp that quickly. He left, but Morant had him followed and killed to prevent him from telling the authorities in Pretoria, the capital of South Africa, what he'd done. Again, I see no evidence of impulsive or grief-stricken behaviour here. This is all well thought out, well planned out, someone trying to cover up their crimes. And I'm sorry to say that it only got worse. Yes, you heard correctly, it got worse. A few days later, Morant ordered his men to open fire on a cart full of women and children, which resulted in the deaths of two very young boys. And when a father and his two sons, one of them who was extremely sick with fever, came to surrender in the hope of getting medical treatment, Morant shot them too. He actually shot the sick boy in his father's arms. He was also very likely to be responsible for the murder of his South African servant. Sadly, history hasn't recorded this man's name, who witnessed the murder of Reverend Hesse. He was there holding Breaker's horse at the time it happened. And he left Fort Edward with Breaker when the man got leave to go to Pretoria, but never arrived there. Unfortunately, his body was never recovered, and due to the systemic racism both before, during, and after the Boer War in South Africa, he wasn't officially recorded as one of Morant's victims either. It was only through careful examination of records much later that we even discovered he existed. However, he played a vital role in getting Morant convicted. He shared what he'd seen with other African servants he knew, and they pass it on to the officers they worked for. Morant, of course, had threatened him and told him not to tell anyone, but he interpreted this as don't tell any other white men. So he told the black men instead. Along with a letter from the men in Morant's unit, this was part of the evidence which ensured Morant himself went before a firing squad. Although the British Army quietly dropped some of the charges, and only prosecuted him for 12 murders rather than the 20 that he undoubtedly committed. Lord Kitchener himself said that sometimes in war, justice must peek out from beneath her blindfold. So how is it possible that anyone, anyone at all, thinks this man is a hero? The problem lies, I think, in the breaker himself. He was a superb liar, and his lies usually had just enough truth in them to make them believable. Like all con men, he was as charming as he was cunning, and the fact that he did any number of reckless daredevil things, as long as he had an audience, meant he was also memorable. The time of his execution is quite significant too. Australia had federated in 1901, January 1901, becoming a single country rather than a collection of colonies of Great Britain. So at the time, we were beginning to form a national identity as Australians and considering what that meant. So we were searching for stories that fitted with the morals and values we had decided were ours. Larrikinism, mateship, a certain disrespect for authority and a fierce independence. Stories like Eureka, which we've discussed before on this podcast, fitted perfectly into this new national myth, as did the highly romanticised version of the story of outlaw and police killer Ned Kelly. He'll feature on this show soon enough, don't you worry. 
After World War I, we would retell the story of the Anzacs to fit this mould. And Breaker Morant, horseman extraordinaire, cheeky bush poet, and dashing storyteller, fit in perfectly by his own design. The murders he committed were explained away and he was presented as an innocent Australian, shot by the British to cover up their crimes. Today, those who fight for Morant to be pardoned argue along similar lines, as do those demanding a retrial. A mock retrial was held in the South Australian town of Bura in 1988 that found Morant innocent. According to the paper, the verdict caused wild celebrations in the town and came about because the three justices of the peace who acted as judges in the quote-unquote retrial found that there was reasonable doubt about whether Morant was acting under orders or not when he committed his crimes. In my view, that is not a point under contention. Lord Kitchener, if he did issue that order, was too clever to have it linked back to himself in any way. So we can't definitively say whether or not Morant was acting under that order at the time. However, there is far too much focus in the story of Breaker Morant on that single aspect of the court-martial. What should also not be under contention, but which unfortunately continues to be debated today, is that Morant committed those murders, the ones he was charged with and others, and that if the order to kill prisoners existed, it was illegal and should not have been followed. I'm personally no advocate for the death penalty, so I don't support the shooting of Morant, but the idea that he was some great Australian hero railroaded by the English and executed for murders he didn't commit? Hell no. It's the killing of children in cold blood that I personally really can't get past. Moran's defenders actually tend to ignore this. They argue that any future retrial or pardon should focus only on the crimes he was charged with at the time in 1901. Retrials happen because new evidence comes to light. So if Morant was posthumously retried, he would be charged with the murders of the children he killed, as he should have been in 1901. The decision to leave these charges out at the time was purely political. The British Army did not want it known among the Boers that, as well as starving their children to death in concentration camps, they were shooting them out on the veldt. As mentioned, the war was coming to an end, and Lord Kitchener and others could foresee a time when Britain would not be so strongly in control of this area as they would be in the immediate aftermath of the war. And they wanted to create a sense of being the benevolent colonial overlords, which they weren't, but that was what they were aiming for at the time. Charging British soldiers with murdering Boer children was probably going to stroke passions and could have even extended the war. So they left it out. But in short, there was nothing heroic about Breaker Morant, but he made sure he would be remembered with his daredevil antics, his mountains of bush poetry, a catchy nickname, and he just so happened to die at a time when Australia was trying to forge its national identity, and he fit the bill for the kind of mythical figure we wanted to venerate. Morant is actually an excellent example of why historical mythmaking can be so dangerous. Ask questions, examine the past, but don't remove aspects of it that don't suit the narrative you want. Morant was a war criminal, plain and simple, and we need to ensure that is the place he continues to occupy in the history of this country. There are plenty of heroes we can turn to, but he sure as hell should not be one. Now, I think it's time for another quick break here. I certainly need a break. And when I return, I'm going to wrap up with one final story about an aspect of this tale that does have something of a happy ending. Hello, skeptics. Before we close out today, there's one colourful character who I think deserves a final mention. Whatever happened to Dargan's Grey? The buck jumper Morant famously rode at the Hawkesbury Show in 1897. 
I've got to tell you, listeners, I researched this expecting to find a sad story. Usually when a rodeo horse became too old to perform or was injured, they were generally just shot or sold to the slaughterhouse. Even in the modern day, there's huge controversy over the fate of retired racehorses. And there was an investigation in Victoria some years ago which accused the racing industry of turning a blind eye to abuses committed against racehorses as they became too old for the track. Now, given this and given the attitudes towards animals in the 19th and 20th centuries, I fully expected poor Dargan's Grey to have had quite a short life that ended with a bullet or at the abattoir. But I'm actually delighted to say that I was wrong. My research turned up something else entirely. So Dargan's Grey continued to throw daredevil riders at buck jumping shows until March 1905 when he was about 16 when he broke a fetlock. Um, He was retired from buck jumping, which I have to say, thank God, I think it's a hideously cruel thing. But he continued to be taken around and exhibited at such events as the original Dargan's Grey. He was never ridden again. And from what I could find, he actually had a very comfortable retirement. And it was commented on by a journalist at a horse show in 1906 that while Dargan's grey was not exactly as shiny and muscular as he had once been and cut a bit of a sorry figure next to some of the younger, brighter horses, he had plenty to eat and was clearly being well taken care of. Now, he died in 1909 at the age of 29 and while travelling from Burke to Nangan in New South Wales. Now, he was well known enough that several of the newspapers in places where he had exhibited in his younger days actually published obituaries for him, which I find rather poignant. And uh, wherever he is now, I hope there's plenty of fresh grass, cool water, endless space for him to jump and run to his heart's content, and no one to put a saddle on him and force him to perform. So, Dargan's Grey, rest in peace. (coughs) And that's it from me today. You can always get in touch at my website, www.skepticalhistory.com. That's skeptical with a K. Or find me on social media. I am Juliana Byers on both LinkedIn and Instagram. The Skeptical Historian is researched, produced and hosted by me, Juliana Byers. You can find a full list of resources used in researching by going to my website and clicking on Sources. Sound effects by Adobe Creative Cloud, used under the Adobe Software License Agreement, and Pixabay, used under a Creative Commons 4.0 International License. Links to all Pixabay sound effects can be found on my website. The music track The Whistle Funk by Telsonic was used under an Epidemic Sound Individual License. Podcast hosting is by Fusebox. See you next time, skeptics. <laughs>